So it's been a while, but a few months ago something great has happened. I finished all of the instrument animations in Roblox Pipe Dream. That's right. In the order of which I animated them, they are the stringos, the vibraphone, the marimba, the bells, the drums, as well as a few other concepts that I had to realize. Also, fair warning, there will be a lot of math involved in this video, so if at any point nothing seems to make sense to you, uh, that's fine because it makes sense to me. To start, I'd like to ask, what is an animation really? Or in other words, how does a computer know what animations are? In mathematical terms, any computer animation is just a parametric function in terms of time. What this means is that for every point we can choose in time, there will be a unique image drawn to the screen at every part. So here's an example. I've drawn a parabola here, which is the shape we want to work with. Let's say we wanted to model a point moving along it, perhaps a ball thrown in the air. So what we can do is we can put a point along the curve and adjust it with the parameter t. And notice how as I move it, it gives the illusion of motion. It really looks like someone's tossing a ball up in the air. This is just an example, but this is also the essence of how computer animations are done. They're all a function of time, like this example is. So let's actually see how I used math to animate all of the instruments. Personally, I've always been very interested in math and I'm always learning off what I know now more than ever. Anyway, the first instrument I graphed was actually like about a year and a half ago. I called them the Stringos. This is where I first succeeded in animating a marble bounce around. The idea is actually kind of simple. Every path the marble takes can be graphed in the xy plane as a parabola. If we just interpolate between the x values according to the time durations that we have, then we have the animation. But the real advantage is that you can see it visually. Basically, with what I came up with, you can guarantee that whichever curve that you graph will be matched by the final parametric equations. So first, I put down all the key points where I want the marbles to hit, as well as the times at which they happen in milliseconds. Next, I need to plot out the trajectories that they take. Part of the way through making this graph, I found a nice equation that you can use to define a parabola using three points two of which we already have, those being the key points. Next thing I do is I take these trajectories along with the time information and I make the final parametric functions for the marble's position. If you were to use keyframes in a traditional 3D animator, this is the kind of graph that you would see. The x-axis is time and the y-axis is the value. Here are the final equations that I made. And in all honesty, I don't really remember how I came up with these exactly, but the idea is this. The final function is made of pieces of these smaller functions, which you can see are just separate trajectories over periods of time. The next trick I use for animating pipe dream is also seen here. The string decay function, or the decaying oscillation function. The strings go back and forth here in a decaying sine wave, and you can see this function w, it depends on the frequency that you set in, as well as how fast it decays. And this function doesn't just model the strings, by the way. Any oscillating instrument after getting hit by a marble uses this function. The strings, the vibraphone arms, because they bounce, the tubular bells, the marimba blocks, even the drums and the cymbals, they all use this function. The next animation I did was the vibraphone. And the first thing was to put the entire model into a Desmos graph. This way I could experiment with it by rotating it around different amounts and all. Uh, the math you actually see in the graph doesn't have anything to do with how Roblox makes them rotate, but I thought it would look cool to see them move in Desmos. And by the way, all the detail in the graphs is purely just for aesthetic reasons. Anyway, the animation for this is really just a bunch of decaying wave functions that we saw earlier. This is really what makes it bounce and come alive. And you can actually adjust the values here to just, like do that. You can make crazy stuff happen. By this point in making the animations, they were all pretty easy to make compared to the first one. I pretty much already had a system for making them. Uh, for the marimba one, this was the most easiest. The only trick here is I had to move this part along this track, as well as I had to know the direction it faces to orient it. The marble part of it, it was really straightforward, except for, again, one trick. Unlike all of the previous animations so far, the plane the marvel travels along is not aligned with the axes. As you can see, it's sloped. 
The trick to solve this is that we pretend the animation is actually along one axis and we sort of view it from that side and then we can determine the third axis just depending on the x-axis. This is done with the simple point slope formula for a line and we plug in an x value and we get out a z value. The bells are the most straightforward and honestly I don't think I really need to explain it. It uses all the techniques I went over before but for the bells. Then I animated the four-way percussion parts, and because they're all really similar, I could just animate one of them and then generalize my code to work on the rest. And because I've implemented object-oriented programming, the base animations are just prototype objects, which means every animation event is just a clone of these base ones. Object-oriented programming also allows me to extend classes off one another. For example, this base four-way percussion class is called 4W, and from there we use our other animations to extend off of it which means it's the exact same class, but modified slightly. This saves us a lot of duplicate code, meaning if we wanted to modify something all these animations had in common, we'd only have to change this one script and then it applies to all of the others. The main drum set animations are exactly like this, but to the extreme. These were by far the most tedious to do. Because there are 10 different trajectories that a marble can take, each one has their own points and numbers associated with it, I had to keep track of this giant table. Here's the Desmos graph for the marble trajectories, and as you can see, it's really involved. If I were to show all of them at once, it would just be a mess, but you can see how all of them play out. In the end, it all worked out though. For every drum animation that's a subclass of the main one, it inputs these points as arguments, and then the marble position is calculated from there. The subclasses themselves are what contain the code for the drum head or the cymbal moving. Here's the Desmos graph for the drum bounce. As you can tell, it's pretty simple. The head just gets moved backwards and the body gets squished and scaled. The cymbals are more complicated, and at first it doesn't seem like it's obvious at all. But my approach to them was to use the same decaying wave function I have been, but to offset one of them. The idea coming from my knowledge that two waves offset by 90 degrees describes circular movement, so I tried this with two axes of the symbols and it worked really well. So far I've covered all the animations for an instrument being directly hit by a marble, but what about all the other movement where there isn't a marble hitting them? The answer is keyframes. A basic example for a keyframe is when the tubular bells move up and down in the middle of the song, they play a couple notes and then they move back up. Another example is when the four-way percussion has to move at any part of the song, how the model itself depends on what current note is playing. But the secret to do all this is before the song is run, the import MIDI script analyzes the notes for a particular instrument and it looks between the pairs of notes. And really, there are two examples of what we'd use this for. The first one being is if we want to detect a long gap between the notes. Like, for example, if I wanted to tell the vibraphone arms when they should go down in the middle of the song, I would have to look between every pair of notes and then check if the time between them is greater than a certain threshold. This tells us that there's a period in the song where they don't play. And when I find those two points, I keep track of the start and the end times and I store them in the list. From there, I pull from one of four hard-coded arm animations, and then I place them in the right spots. The song starting, the song ending, the middle section starting, and the middle section ending. The second example is when it's possible to have an action happen between every pair of notes. This is when I want to have the four-way percussion rotate. I would have to know both what note it's heading towards and what note it's coming from. And this means between the four notes, there are 16 possibilities we need to consider. My solution was genius. Take all the four possible starting positions and ending positions and create a 4x4 four four matrix representing all ordered pairs of notes. For example, we can read this cell as from the splash to the hi-hat. And from this drawing, we can see that to get from the splash to the hi-hat, we need to rotate the entire model by 90 degrees, and specifically in this direction. So we account for that by writing negative 90 degrees in that cell. And that's just one example. Another example is, what if we have the same position twice in a row? Or in other words, what if we start and end on the same instrument? It makes sense that we wouldn't move anything at all, right? So we can write this as whenever the matrix has the same row and column, we don't do anything. In other words, the diagonal of this matrix has no action, denoted by the nil symbol. I filled in all the other points by checking the original pipe dream video and seeing how it moved, and I also filled in just a few others just by best guesses. 
Implementing this in code is pretty straightforward. We store the matrix as a 2D array, then we look through every pair of notes, we find which animation to apply according to the matrix, and then we add it onto the keyframes that we already have. Really, what we're doing is we're making a lookup table of sorts, only instead of a lookup table, we're making a lookup matrix. In total, there are four different keyframe tracks that we want to make. The vibraphone and bells, they both move in and out during sections. The forward percussion and the hi-hat movement are all according to lookup matrices. And what I love is that you wouldn't think at all if I told you the hi-hat was animated almost identically to the four-way rotation, but in fact, the math behind them is almost the same. And for this video, there's exactly one last thing that I want to tackle. The thing I want to talk about is the keyframes. How do we actually interpolate between them? So after a while, I figured out the code to do this, which I found by graphing some points in Desmos. Eventually, I got it though. Notice with these types of keyframes, you can define a transition function, which is from zero to one, which you can use to make different types of eases. In the game, there are a couple scripts which run the keyframes, which I call motion parameters. Here, the number values are updated every frame, which they describe the state of an instrument. For example, the vibe position runs from zero to one. The drum rotation is the four-way percussion rotation in radians. Keyframes is just the Lua table that holds the keyframe info. Keyframe updater is just the logic in the Desmos graph. And finally, model updater is what actually reads the number and then puts the model in the correct position. I think that's enough for this video. I showed you all of the math that I've done so far, which has been a lot. In the next video, I'll show you the code that I wrote to do all of what I said in practice, and a bit more. So stay tuned for that.